The funding for this video is provided by the amazing members of our Patreon. Also contributions from viewers like you. Thank you. Yeah, I started from PBS Kids. What you gonna do? Fight me? Anyway, roll the video. Paradise Kiss is one of those animes that's often overlooked, but it doesn't surprise me because it's a part of the most overlooked genre demographic of anime. Jose. Jose is the anime demographic for women and is often focused on the struggles of womanhood. Many people never heard of Jose because it's so hard to find anything new for it. Like the only new Jose I can think of that actually has an audience is a Gretzko. When it comes to Jose, you either never heard of it, can't stream it, have to watch it on bootleg, or the mangas are no longer available for sale. Nah, y'all think I'm lying? I had to buy the series off of fucking Makari because I couldn't find it nowhere online to read. Like, because of the lack of attention that this anime demographic gets, what people think is Jose is either Shinin or Shoujo. Growing up, the only anime I ever really cared for was Shoujo, so it makes sense as an adult, I would want to move up from that and go to Jose. As I want more mature stories about older people, and as I did my research on Jose, one particular story kept popping up and its visuals is what brought me in. And that is Paradise Kiss. So I gifted myself the manga series for Christmas. Paradise Kiss, I was a bit disappointed to see that so much of the story focused on high school seniors, but it didn't bother me because it was explained why they were there next to their adult counterparts as they did mirror each other throughout the story. As these groups of people that are in different stages of their lives and they struggle with similar things. And one of those similarities? Confidence and bad manners. You think the students are reading this story? No, the adults are like very fucking rude. The way we see how low self-esteem affects different people at different ages is what makes this story so horrifying and oh so painful. But it's also what makes it iconic and memorable. back with another video hi hello how are you guys doing my name is Harryana and welcome to or welcome back to the pirate ship also known as Harry Hook's pirate ship I am the cap and you are not my first mate I don't got no first mate because you want to know why come here come here bring your ear here I let everyone in on a little secret when they come over to this channel Nobody's worthy of being the first mate, but hi, hello, how are you guys doing? My name is Harryana, and I like to make content based off nostalgia and family and children's entertainment and all the issues that I find within those spaces. We are in for a long one, okay? Today, I know I have been posting a lot more shorter content lately, but that's because I have so much longer form content to come that it's taking me a bit of time to make. So to still give something out, I've been making shorter, smaller videos in between, so I don't leave y'all slacking, I don't leave you guys hanging, but this story, we are here to discuss Paradise Kiss. I literally purchased this book series, um, manga series, over winter break. It was a gift for myself, as I mentioned before, and I didn't read it until the winter time, like the like the next month in January when I was back to work. And you know when you're on set, you have a lot of downtime and whatnot. So I would bring Paradise Kiss to work with me to read. And <laughs> I know after I made that community post, I know y'all have some things to say. I have some things to say. I ended up finding out a lot of other people who are aware of this series have some things to say. But I don't really see that it gets talked about much on YouTube. And I did watch a few other videos for a few other creators that have talked about the series. But I didn't watch them yet because I didn't want it to affect my opinion on the series. 
I just want to sit here and talk about why Paradise Kiss scares me for all of the right reasons. <laughs> Paradise Kiss is a book that I fell in love with on the first edition, but the more and more I read, the more fucking irritated I got with it. In a good way. It isn't a bad thing that this story made me angry because this story is supposed to make you upset. Nuance, people. Nuance. There's some things in certain stories that aren't supposed to make you happy. That is how a lot of art is. But just because Paradise Kiss made me angry, that doesn't mean that I thought it was a bad story. Not at all. Paradise Kiss is the sequel to the series Neighborhood Story, which is kind of funny how the sequel is way more popular than the prequel. A lot of people never even really heard of the prequel, and part of that has to blame with one, the manga was never translated into fucking English, and two, it wasn't dubbed into English either. So if you are an English speaking person or somebody that just don't, you know, your native language is not Japanese and you don't understand it, the only way that you are able to get into neighborhood story is by watching the anime and you have to read the subtitles that's how i came around to watching it that's why i was so opposed to getting into neighborhood story and i really like it it's so adorable i i think it's just super cute it's my kind of show it gives progeny vibes all right support the progenies now on the surface paradise kiss follows the story of yukari she is a high school senior that doesn't really know much of what she wants in life and she ends up befriending a group of kids that attend a fashion school after she meets the paradise kiss gang Yukari finds a lot of interest within the fashion industry especially becoming a model and after she meets these people she's able to learn more about herself and find herself worth but that, that's a catch Paradise Kiss is also a tale about numerous women and girls appealing to the male gaze and not really knowing themselves outside of men just as well. And one interesting thing I see in particular with Paradise Kiss that I do want to highlight is that as we do see um, abusive dynamics, we see them in three different ways. We see a bit of friendship abuse, we see relationship abuse, and then we also see child abuse. And it is, oh Jesus. Y'all know the, all them like Nene Leaks clip compilations where she's just over here like, that was me this entire time with the story. Paradise Kiss is a tale in my opinion about sad people. Like you can live in the nicest part of town, you can have a good paying job, you can have fame, you can have fortune, but that still won't make you happy if you don't like the person that you are or the person that you're becoming or the people that you associate yourself with. As Paradise Kiss is a story that focuses more on character than plot, instead of talking about the plot of the story because it's low-key kind of irrelevant, I will be talking about the different kind of characters and what they deal with throughout the series. Because when we are introduced to this uh, production, we find out that there's a talent show, not a talent show, there's a fashion show that they're getting ready for. And I, I kid you not, midway through, they, they forget that there even is a fashion show. <laughs> Like, it's funny because in the first book, we are introduced that it, it, there's a fashion show, but it's low-key not important because it literally hits you out of nowhere where they're like, oh yeah, the fashion show's a week away. We do have an event that we need to put on. I was like, what? But also, as a viewer, as a reader, you low-key forget that there's a fashion show either because the story focuses more on character development than it does the actual story. And before we begin and before we go any further, I just want to make sure y'all are aware that this came out during the Y2K era of Earth. So it's dated. It's dated as hell. So yeah, you're going to be in for some. This show came out in the Y2K era and it shows it badly. <laughs> let's go let's go ahead and start off with our main girl Yukari for the most part Paradise Kiss is Yukari's story while it is about the fashion world and the modeling world and the glitz and glamour and luxury this story all is about her it all comes back to her in the end yes I stole that from Stella in the Spades but the story isn't about the factions it's about her 
Sella Summers. Yukari is something all right for the most part. She doesn't really know herself all too well and part of that has to do with the fact that she just wants to please her mother and she wants to please her family. She doesn't want to do what she wants. She's doing what her mother wants and because of that she's unsure of what she wants to do. She's not sure what kind of job she wants. She's not sure what career path she wants to go into. She just knows that she needs to pass her college entrance exams so she can get into a good school and get a good paying job. Which is why when she got hit with the idea that she had the possibility of being a model as she is very very pretty and she also is tall she's about five seven five eight that's why she was a bit skeptical of that because she never even thought that there was a possibility for her to have this kind of job but it's funny because as the story goes on we do start to see that yakari lightens up a bit because in the beginning she's very cold she's very nasty the attitude stank okay it stank and so many of her cold tendencies had to do with the fact that she, one, didn't know herself, and two, she didn't know what she wanted in life. She didn't know what she wanted outside of going to school, getting good grades, getting into a good college, and then getting a boring ass job after that, and so on and so on. I felt as if Yukari was trying to be like her mother, as her mother presented herself as this very smart woman. But then when we actually pay attention to her mom, we see that she's just sad. She's just very sad. And she takes so much of her self-hatred and her anger and her bitterness out on her daughter. Yukari doesn't know herself, nor does she respect herself. And it's how George, who I can't fucking stand, her love interest in the story gets away with treating her terribly for so long. Like he talks down to her, he treats her like shit, he's a borderline bully. But the funniest thing I find about Yukari and George's interaction and their dynamic is while him being terrible to her helped her see herself work, but her being good to him and actually telling him what the fuck he needed to hear helped him grow too. Like, it's honestly so interesting. But George, on the other hand, he's a borderline bully and so much of the interest that Yukari had in him had to do with the fact that he was very interested in her in the first place because he, he fucking borderline bully, like not bullies her, he kidnaps her. Like, I'm not even joking. Like he kidnaps her, he takes her to his studio that he works in with his friends who are Arashi, Mawako, and Isabella. Who we gonna get to later because I have so much to say about little Miss Mawako. And it's so frustrating to see because as the story continues to goes on, we continue to see George belittle her. We continue to see George talk down on her like she's shit. Like, it's funny because it seemed like things between them ended up getting worse after they slept together. But George being so awful to her is what helped her grow as a person, as I said earlier. Because it helps her stand up for herself and it helps her go after the things that she wants to do. And her realizing that changed her life. Like, at one point of the story, Yukari literally runs away because her abusive-ass mother was just doing the most and she was just sick of her shit, so she left and she ends up staying with George during her time away. And during this time away from her mother and her being with George, not only did she see what we all been knew, he was full of shit, but she also got to meet his mother and she saw how much of a sad woman she was and she realized she did not want to turn into that. When Yukari meets the other people in George's life, it helps her see of how much of a hot mess he is because not only does she meet his mother, she meets his mother's best friend who is the owner of a modeling agency that she does end up signing to because she asked her to join because she saw her do a photo shoot for the Happy the happy Berry brand. We gonna get back to that brand later. And it's funny because she sees these two women who are the same age and she sees one who gave up on life and just stayed there for a terrible ass man and treats her like shit. And then she saw another one that was doing pretty well and she was going after the things she wanted and took no shit from nobody. She needed to see that. So then we get to Hiro Hiroki 
Hiroyuki, a guy that who goes to Yukari's school, he becomes worried about her. He informs her family about what is going on. It, it, it was a mess. But he mainly did this because he cared. I was not really upset with him doing this to her in the first place. But for the sake of this, and I don't want to keep butchering this dude's name, we just gonna call him Hero because that's what Mawako called him this whole time, okay? Hero. Hero, for the most part, helps Yukari as he sees that she's falling apart and he also wants her to get back on track. He does notice that Yukari is struggling a bit with who she is and what she wants in life and he's very understanding of that and he gives her and he basically is that person that she is able to talk to about how she feels about school as she doesn't go to school with the other Paradise Kiss kids. She goes to school with Hero and a few others that we don't really see much of and they're very irrelevant to the story at the end of the day because they don't seem to be good friends to them anyway. Now Hero, we're gonna bring him back later. I want you to remember him. Now back to George, bitch ass. He's just, like I said, he's just a bully. I don't like him, but that is actually his purpose in the story. You're not really supposed to like him and you're not really supposed to root for him either. But in the end, we do see that he does grow and change and become a better person because so much of George's terrible ass behavior has to do with the fact that his dad is awful just as well. So many of his terrible characteristic traits were from him picking those up from his father and seeing the way that he treats women. Because like I said, he's not just terrible to Yurkari. He's terrible to Mawako. He's terrible to Isabella. And he's especially terrible to his own fucking mother. And from other things that we have picked up in the past, he's not good to his other female partners just as well. I don't understand why people be saying that George and Yukari are goals. They're not. Like, where? Because he's a fashion designer and she's a model? That's why you say that's your goals? No, they obviously were not happy. While they did love each other, just because two people love each other don't mean they need to be together. While Yukari was able to grow and learn from her relationship with George, I was very happy to see that she didn't end up with him and she wasn't going to keep forcing something that obviously wasn't working. And she does eventually get with Hero. I love that for her. And then she also becomes a great model too. She, she's kind of the only one who gets a happy ending. time we bring it up Yukari because we gotta bring up Miss Moako now. Whew. We see Kari as things ended up getting better for her and her life in the end. Moako, I wouldn't really say that she didn't get a happy ending because she never had a happy life from the start. But Wako just always stayed bad in my opinion. She stayed bad but she found new ways to deal with her pain. Now I found this amazing article that summed up a bit of how I felt when it came to some of the characters within this series and I'm gonna sit here and read you guys the introduction paragraph because this is literally how I felt with the rest of the female characters that I'm gonna be talking about in this video. I will play that and then I'll be back with the rest of my commentary. Well, Yukari's story is a wonderful coming-of-age story of a girl learning not to be defined by those around her. The female secondary characters, Mawako and Isabella, are not so lucky. Although they are two coming of age in their own right, their stories are severely lacking compared to Yukari's. This is more or less to be expected considering they are supporting characters, but they deserve much more fleshed out characterization than they got. Mawako is a character that I truly think deserves better. She's very nice, very sweet, very bubbly. She's very forgiving also, and that is um, her character's downfall. She is the little sister of Makako, who is the main character in this show's predecessor, Neighborhood Story. And from uh, what I picked on in Paradise Kiss and from watching Neighborhood Story, Mawako and Makako do not have the best parents. And it makes sense why Mawako lives with her older sister and her daughter and her husband. Because Mawako and Makako's mother, she acts more like a friend 
been a parent to them and she's not really in her youngest daughter's life all that much and then from what we can pick up in neighborhood story her and Mo Kako's relationship was not great like I remember in one particular episode she was going off on her mother and talking to her as if she were going off on a kid her own age and I was just like huh Moako ends up dating a character that I think I hated the most in this story oh jesus his name is Areshi, and Areshi basically is the son of makako's best friend risa okay that that's her son that's risa's son so that's how Areshi fits into the neighborhood story paradise kiss storyline funny thing about that um keep in mind that Areshi and bawako known each other for like ever because that is part of the downfall of this relationship. The most interesting thing in particular about Moako's character is that she's the one that we see with the most like loudest outfits. Her hair is literally pink. She's always wearing mixed match clothing. Her outfits are usually like they stand out so much and they express her and she's always smiling she's always giggling she loves to eat sweets she's like sweet as pie like when you look at the surface and she even has like the lightest squeakiest voice ever when you look at Moako from the surface she looks like she's happy but deep down she's hurting because one, she feels as if she can never be good as her older sister, Makako. And she was talking about how so much of the clothes that she designs just feels like rip off of her sister's designs. So her confidence isn't really up there when it comes to her work. And two, her boyfriend treats her like shit. Ereshi, I never liked Ereshi from the beginning after he yelled at Yukari when he first met her. Because before we found out that Arashi was abusing Mawako, we could already infer that he was an abusive person to begin with because him screaming at Yukari foreshadowed his behavior towards his partner later on. Like when he met Yukari, she had a very nasty attitude and he just fucking shouted at her and it was extremely uncalled for. There was no need for him to shout at a stranger like that because yes, I understand Yukari was being fucking rude, but you gotta think about the context of the situation that she was in. One, she was a place she never been in. Two, she ain't fucking know none of those people. And three, she didn't even know why she was there. So moving on from our introduction to him, the more we find out about him, the more and more you don't like him. He literally is the only character in the end that I just kind of had no respect for whatsoever. I had more respect for George than I did for Arashi, okay? Because we find out that Arashi forbid Mawako from talking to Hiro. And part of the reason why is because we find out that Arashi is a bit jealous of Hiro as he sees Hiro to be perfect. And y'all want to know why Arashi was able to get Mawako to choose him over Hiro? He R-worded her. I, I, I don't like and that honestly in my opinion is what set their relationship up for failure because so much of their relationship was so focused on sex I remember she ended up finding out because there's a part where I mentioned you know Yukari ends up running away she ends up staying at Arashi's place and he has his own apartment because his parents it's uh, okay one thing about Paradise Kids in my opinion is that a lot of these kids was like grown grown over here living by themselves and staying out in the wee hours of the night and whatever Mawako finds out that Yukari isn't staying there anymore. By the way, Mawako likes to call Yukari Caroline and a lot of other people call her Caroline just as well. She was like, oh, since Caroline's not going to be at your place no more, that means we can have sex there. And I was just like, and anytime we see Arashi and Mawako within this story, so much of it has to do with them having sex. Whenever he's upset, she thinks that having sex with him will make him feel better, especially if the given scenario is that he's upset with her. We have seen him push her. We have seen him pull her hair. We have seen him shout and scream at her. We have seen him break her phone. He literally broke her damn phone. He went through it, saw that she was talking to Hero, and threw it at the wall and broke it. And I 
strongly dislike how Mawako's arc ends is because she ends up a marrying this dickhead and has a child with him. So now she's stuck with him. As much as I don't like what happened with Mawako's character in the end, I understand it because that's how life is for some people. You end up being with somebody who's abusing you and who's terrible to you, but you put all that aside, you marry them, and then you end up having kids with this person and you're stuck with them. Mawako literally ended up becoming one of those people. Mawako low-key reminds me of Luann from King of the Hill. Like, I see the parallels there where they're just treated like shit by almost everyone in their life. And then they do meet somebody that does help them, but that doesn't really do much. And then in the end, it's just like... Part of the reason Mawako ends up like this is because she doesn't really know herself outside of Areshi. She literally known him since she was a little small girl. She grew up with him. She was always around him. They went to the same school. Literally, he was always in her life. He was always there. She doesn't really know a life outside of him. And he was always bossing her around since they were small. So she was just used to it and she thought this behavior was all right. And I also can't stand how Arashi took advantage of the fact that Mawako was very, I don't want to say she's childlike, but she's very positive and free spirited. And it's like, she doesn't care. She's super duper nice. She's like, you know, those little ball ball things like black girls like to wear in their hair. Like she will wear stuff like that. And she just didn't care. She was extremely carefree. She literally carried candy around her purse because she says it helps her feel better. Like she was a very like sweet soul and he took advantage of that. Hey, it's, it's me. I'm not editing right now because I'm tired, but I have some more thoughts and opinions about Mawako, but also her sister Makako, because, all right, I felt like so much of Mawako's character was her trying to be like her older sister Makako, because I'm not sure if you guys have watched my video I made about Good Luck Charlie, because if you guys are familiar with Good Luck Charlie, Teddy ended up taking back um, Spencer, who she had a really toxic relationship with. Like, literally in the first season, like, our introduction to Good Luck Charlie, we find out that Spencer cheated on her. And I felt as a part of the reason why Teddy went back with him was because she wanted to be like her mother. She wanted to be like her parents, as her parents had been together for, like, ever they were literally like high school sweethearts and they put up with each other's bullshit all the time and this and that and the third. I felt as if Mawako wanted to be like Makako because, like I said, I did think it was very important for me to have some kind of viewing of neighborhood story before making this video, especially when it came to Maka Mawako's character because so much of Mawako's character reminds me so much of her older sister Makako and we don't really spend much time with Makako in Paradise Kiss because it's mainly she's just working we don't really see much of her we just see her in work work don't stop mode and we do see her interact with your your Yakari more than we do like her own sister and her own family we don't really see much of her outside of you know working but with Neighborhood Story, the entire show is about her. It's her series. And we do get a glimpse of who she is before she matured and turned into a big businesswoman that she was working towards in Neighborhood Story. One thing in particular that I find interesting about her is that there was a guy that she grew up with and she ended up marrying. Like she know him since she was little. As she didn't want to be at home with her mom, she would always be at his house. They were literally like high school sweethearts, not even really high school sweethearts, I say, but they've known each other since they were very small. And they ended up getting married. Uh, they have a daughter together named Alice. And we see that Mawako is often babysitting her little sister. So when you look back at Mawako's history, we see that it's very similar to her sisters as she likes to design clothes she wears funky outfits and she has been with the same guy since like forever and 
she ends up marrying the guy that she's been with forever like since she's known her entire life and Mawako like Makako in my opinion when it came to neighborhood story neighborhood story is low-key kind of frustrating because so much of the story has is just like her like Makako being mad at that boy and it's low-key irritating and Paradise Kiss is way shorter than Neighborhood Story, okay? So we spend less time with Moako than we did Makako. You got a whole show about her. And then Moako, this isn't even her damn show. Like, she's literally a supporting character. And I feel like part of the reason why is because it's as if I was trying to eyes the name of the woman who created this story. It's as if she was trying to redo mawako story makako story but in a different setting like in a different light i don't know that's just kind of like my theory on it because i'm gonna be real nobody was really checking for neighborhood story like neighborhood story didn't even get translated into like another language it did not get no english dub it did not even get an english manga like there's mangas over here like sugar kara never got a dub but at least they got a damn manga like nobody is checking for a neighborhood story and i feel like so much of what happened in that story was just repeated into paradise kiss and i felt like she did a lot of that through um Bowako's character because the happy berry brand that makako was creating um that is like very present and relevant up in paradise kiss like it's literally like the main brand it's the brand that everyone loves like literally when she found out like when Yakari found out Mawako's sister owned Happy Berry she was like starstruck kind of like I feel like they just she just repeated so much of the shit with her little sister because like nobody was really checking for her original story okay that's all I gotta say about this <laughs> I'll be <laughs>to talk about George's mother oh this bitch because what happened with George's mom I can see this happening with Moako in the future and Yukari in the future if she didn't change her um direction George's mother you can know is a person that ended up ruining so much of her life and just herself in general because she ended up getting involved with a terrible man and when Yukari meets Yukaino, she realizes that this is not the kind of person that she wants to turn into. Which contributes to her detachment from George later on. And the sad thing about it is that Yukaino has so much good going for herself. Like she literally was a model, was over here booking jobs. And she literally threw all that away to be with the man that treated her like shit. And she ended up getting pregnant with him and just didn't care anymore. She just gave up on everything. She didn't have to stop modeling after she had a baby. But she chose to do that. And she regretted it. She admitted it. Instead of continuing modeling, she decides to be George's father's mistress. And we see that she's not happy. She has no life outside of this man. He's the one that buys her designer bags. He pays her rent for that nice apartment that she stays in. He buys her food. He buys her clothing. <sighs> He's doing all this stuff for her while fucking other women on the side and while also not respecting her in general. And she knows that if she leaves him, she's gonna have to leave this life of luxury behind. Oh my God, I could not say it right. What am I trying to say? But George's father, he, okay, George sees the way that his father treats Yukino. And because of that, George starts to treat his mother, Yukino, the way that his father treats her, okay. And also, this reminds me a bit of, you know, like, you know, like, we see the stuff about, like, the rapper baby mama stuff and just celebrities in general, where their partner is notorious for, like, cheating on them, but they won't leave and they won't stay. And part of the reason we know why they won't leave and they continue to put up with this fuckery is because we know that if they leave that life of luxury, not we know, they know just as well, they know that if they leave that man, they let his ass go 
they got to leave that life of luxury behind. Like, they'll be fine, but they'll not be living in an expensive penthouse, okay? They'll not be having the Louis Vuitton and the Chanel and Prada bags. They'll not have the Michael Kors and Christian Dior and the Boston Lenciaga and all of that stuff. They're not going to be able to go shop at Lenox Ball and not just go to Forever 21 and Bath and Body Works. They can go everywhere else in there. They can go to Nike. They can go to Chanel. They can go to Louis. They can go to Nike. They can do all of that. They can go shop on Melrose. They can go shop all the expensive ass places. But they know that in order to have that stuff, in order to go buy the most expensive ass clothing, in order to go to five star restaurants once a week or even twice or three or whatever, not have to cook your meals and whatever the fuck and driving a Benz and having a Lamborghini. And what's that Rolls Royce? That's another one that I love. I know a lot of rich people see. They know that if they leave that man, they have to kiss all of that goodbye. Like, they can still live comfortably. They can have a Honda Accord in a nice little one-story house in a safe suburb. But they don't want that. So they put up with being treated badly so they can have more. It's tragic. The best advice I can give to any woman that is putting her career on the back burner for a man, I only got... How many words is this? I got four words for you, baby. Leave that nigga alone. That's all I gotta say on that. It's not worth it for real. And the only main female character in this story that didn't really seek any kind of male validation was Isabella. And when I say main female character, I'm talking about the ones that the story focused on the most, the ones that were pushed towards the front, not a lot of the side characters and whatnot, nah. Because they already had their careers and all of that jazz. We're talking about the people that were still growing and still finding themselves. Isabella was the only one I'd say that didn't seek male validation. And while yes, that is one thing I truly did enjoy about her character, Ew. it's nice that we see that Isabella was in love with her passion and her career choices and all of that she loved beauty she loved style she loved fashion that was everything to her but we also need to bring up the fact that Isabella is a trans woman Isabella is the only trans woman in this story to be exact and this story low-key kind of forgot that she was there sometimes Isabella doesn't do much of anything. Actually, no. Like, Isabella doesn't do shit. It's funny because in the first three books, she's just there with her friends and, like, being a helping hand towards them. We don't really get an individual Isabella scene away from the group until book four. And it wasn't even that long. Because this is the book. I know if y'all follow me, y'all know I be posting that on oh, picture all the time where Mawako Mo was crying up in Isabella's arms. This was the book that it happened and that happened after that sequence. Because in the fourth book, we see that Mawako cries into her arms when she is stressed out and she skipped class to finish making that tiara for the outfit with them and the teacher ended up taking it because they are not supposed to be working on their outside projects during school hours. You will get in trouble if you are skipping class to work on personal projects and then after that we finally get to spend some time with her character away from everyone and we get to learn a little bit about her family which we don't see her love for fashion and then that's it and then we also find out that George was one of her closest friends and he was one of the first people to accept her as a girl when that's what she wanted to identify as but then, oh my god, it's just kind of annoying because even though George and Isabella got that day one shit together, it annoyed me the way that George would speak to her. Isabella, in my opinion, acts more like a mother to the friend group than their friend. And she's even fucking labeled as the mom friend. Hi everyone, editing me here. As I am like, you know, editing the Isabella section of this video, I would like to say some more things about it because it's making me more and more mad now that I, I, I wrote that part out, I sat on it, but now I'm going back and I'm like, you know, looking at it, I'm getting like more and more pissed off because this is just something I've noticed when it comes to I, y'all, as I was work. And I don't want nobody over here thinking that I made this Paradise Kids video just to like shit on her work. 
no I'm just giving it some criticism when it comes to Isabella's story so much of it is you know her either being there for her friends or her being misgendered the entire time like I understand like that was this came out in the early 2000s it and you know how um how things are just so different now than they were in the past but like everybody just kept referring to Isabella as a man especially Mawako and um Yukari when Yukari would be talking about her in her head it would just be really fucking annoying to deal with but you know bringing nuance to this it is a product of its time it's very very dated so that aspect I'm like okay it was still very bothersome to watch but one other thing that pisses me off was that how I mentioned she didn't really have no arc outside of her friends when it comes to Aya Ozawa's work one thing that I have noticed about it is that she does a much better job when it comes to telling stories about women than she does men and we know that trans women are women we do not do transphobic shit over here either I just kind of get frustrated because I felt as if Ayawazawa was giving Isabella like the male treatment like in this story where she wasn't really all that important and she didn't really give her much shit to do in this and the third. And one of the reasons why I enjoy Ayawazawa's work so much is because it is very female focused, female centered and you know female friendship is a big aspect of it too. Because what we do see there is a big female friendship in the story. It's between Yakari and it's for um it's Yakari and Mawako and we don't really see Yakari interact with Isabella one-on-one and we do see Mawako interact with Isabella too but it just you know it came down to her like just kind of like taking care of Mawako because I remember she was like buttoning up Mawako's shirt when her like boobies were out and then you know the entire situation where they was working on the thing outside of class it was just kind of like she was like Mawako's little support person it, it was just very like frustrating to see Ayala Zawa in my opinion I really think she could have done a bit of a better job when it came to Isabella's story because I understand she wanted to have that representation in her story and this was during the time we weren't really seeing many trans characters well trans characters that were getting good representation in the media so it was nice to see that Isabella was there but she could have done much much better about it because when we meet Isabella the entire time we're seeing her she's either there helping her friends or everybody's calling her a man and then when we actually do get to spend some time with her it's just about her you know being trans and how her and George became like friends because he was one of the first people that accepted her as a girl it's just kind of frustrating because Isabella low-key kind of feels like she didn't serve much of a purpose in this fic not fic story mixing up terminology but I ended up finding this article and it's a blog that um posts about like trans um trans girls that are in um anime they basically kind of hit every point that I was feeling when it came to Isabella's character and I wanted to do my part as being a good ally I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to speak over trans people at this moment because I'm not it's just I got really kind of frustrated when it came to the LGBTQ representation that came within this story and nothing much was done with it because we do find out that George is bisexual but most of the time we just see his interactions with other women and then we see how he treats women horribly and we do see him interact with like guys from time to time but it's just kind of like oh he's by there and then we also have Isabella and she just did very little to nothing and it's just kind of you know how I feel like because I am a black woman I am a part of a marginalized group in the world I think that's why it bothers me so much because you know how these are the people that are different in this story these are the ones that stand out the most like you know how in a lot of American media where we have the black character they stand out the most because they are you know different from their white counterparts and whatnot I feel like that's why it just kind of irritates me so much with this story because it just 
it could have been much better but then also i have to remember that this was a product of its time if this story came out in this day and age you would be seeing the shit get dragged <laughs> In stark contract to the rest of her appearances in this anime, Isabella arrives by physically looming over an already anxious Yukari, frightening her so bad that she faints into Isabella's arms. Subsequently, Isabella most oc mostly occupies scenes in the background, making tea, preparing snacks, or smiling knowingly at the plot. She has a few key scenes where her dialogue is important, but the vast majority of these involve Isabella giving exposition via advice or explaining the intentions of another character, usually George. Out of the five main characters that make up the Toronto group, Paradise Kiss, Isabella by far receives the least screen time and character development with little to no character arc to speak of. This is due in large to the nature of the anime. Being a romance drama, the show focuses largely on the romantic exploits of the characters. There's Yukari and George, of course, Mawako and Arashi, who are already in an established relationship. Hiro, the initial object of Yukari's affection, who also pays a larger role in Mawako and Arashi's relationship drama, and even George's old flames. Where does Isabella fit into this, you may ask, but the answer isn't unfortunate as simple she doesn't the anime neglects almost emphasize on almost entirely to give isabella romance you will either feel like this scarlett johansson meme i love how yukari ended up getting a happy ending that she deserved i was sad to see that mawako just is stuck with the man that was ruining everything for her but it was very realistic we don't even really know what happened to isabella in the end it's like the story forgot she was there. Oh my god, one thing that just kind of annoys me though about Isabella's story is that like, I kid you not, I legit do think the author forgot that she was there sometimes, okay? Because sometimes it would just be so out of the ass where Isabella would just come out of nowhere and just say like a random line here and there. And I'm just like, excuse me? Now, the range of emotions that I have with Paradise Kiss Reminds me so much of the range of emotions that I had when I was watching Mandy Kaling's Never Have I Ever on Netflix. And wow, Never Have I Ever, I don't go here because that does not fit my niche on this channel. The way I felt with that series was how I felt with this series right here. Mind you that I didn't watch Never Have I Ever until after I read and watched Paradise Kids. Paradise Kiss, like Never Have I Ever, is a great story, but it's not for everybody. You'll either feel like this Scarlett Johansson meme, or you'll feel like this Nene Leakes meme. Th this is literally how I feel, the Nene Leakes meme. Was I sad when Paradise Kiss ended? Because I know a lot of people talk be talking about, I don't want my favorite anime to end. I get sad when I get to the end. No, I was happy when it got to the end because I was like, please, get on. I was low-key ready for it to be over with because it was frustrating me so much. Like, that's how I literally felt when I was watching Never Have I Ever because Davey kept making so many terrible-ass decisions. Everybody in this book was making horrible-ass decisions and I wanted to throw it against the wall. But that's what made it so great because they felt human. They felt real. I appreciate how all authentic and raw the characters were in this series. I love how flawed they were and a lot of them learn from their mistakes and move on. While yes, I enjoy Paradise Kiss a lot. Like how I am enjoy Never Have I Ever a lot. But just because I like a piece of media does not mean it's gonna like, you know, not frustrate me. That's one thing that I can't stand nowadays when it comes to criticism is that so many people think that when you express frustration when it comes to a certain piece of media that you automatically hate it. No, I love Paradise Kiss a lot, but so many things about the story piss me off. But that is what makes the story great. Like would never have I ever, Davey making all those terrible ass decisions is what makes the story great. That being said, like Paradise Kiss and Never Have I Ever Alike, if you are not in a good headspace, this is not something I'd recommend for you, okay? They're good projects, they're amazing, but like come back to them when you feel better, baby, all right? Hold off on it until things get better for you. 
that is pretty much it for this paradise kids video i hope you guys liked that please do because i worked really hard on this this was a video that i had planned since i read it back in the winter time and i'm i'm so i was so ready to be done with it because these characters was getting on my nerves and i was ready to get my thoughts and opinions out there but if you liked it please make sure you leave a thumbs up make sure you hit that subscribe button if you're not i really appreciate that if you want to know ways that you can support me and the channel um i have donation links down below i have buy me a coffee i have coffee and I have Patreon. On Patreon, you get early access to my videos. You get the behind the scenes footage of what it goes into making these videos because it's not as easy as people think. A lot of time, research, blood, sweat, tears goes into this stuff you also get behind the scenes look on what it's like for me to work on my store i give business advice over there just as well and also you get exclusive behind the scenes videos that do not see the later date on this channel so subscribe to my patreon down below also if you just want to support me and my work subscribe to the patreon I, I truly do appreciate that all right i also have merchandise down below on harryganahook.com that's a link to my site the do-rag that i'm wearing on my head it is back up for peer order if you order it you will get it by mid, uh, mid july we love that um want to know another way to support me we have a gofundme campaign going on right now for my web series called the progenies the link to that will be down below if you guys want to know ways you can support me for free watch the progenies the links to our episodes and shorts and specials will be down below just as well and then another way you can support me for free is just to follow me on everything at harriana h-a-r-r-i-y-a-n-n-a -N -N -A. thank you guys so much for watching and have a good night Cause I work hard to get to this point in my life. I'm blowing up, so don't hate. Just congratulate. Hold the power of girls will just blow your mind. But a cup I fill in three at a time. Bubbles will smile while kicking your butt and bouncing will leave them out of their butt. Cherish and power puff, two of a kind Both wanna save the world before bad times From Townsville, Memphis, New York to LA The power puff girls are just here to say They coming through and fighting And everyone they shocking You know no one can stop them all Because of the chemical X They coming through and fighting And everyone they shocking You know no one can stop them all